All right. Hi, friends. How you doing? This is Kyle Brown. I am a coach who empowers conscious visionaries to rapid harmony, if you aren't familiar with who I am. And I have a long time friend here with me. We're doing, uh, as you know, a, a fit uh, series based on going from fear to fit. And I was thinking, okay, who in my Rolodex of elite, incredible uh, world changers would be a great asset to bring in here, help uh, all of you out in this time of crisis, bringing you from a place of fear, if you're there at all, or anxiety into a place of confidence, empowerment, and fitness. And uh, I'm here with my really good friend, Dr. Michael Mantel, and I'll give you all a bit of his background first before we get rocking on our convo. He is uh, just incredible. He earned his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and is a highly sought after behavioral science coach, speaker, consultant, and author. He has served as the chief psychologist for Children's Hospital San Diego and the San Diego Police Department and served as an assistant clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry at UCSD Medical School, where he focused on creating and delivering doctor-patient relationship course. Very cool. Most recently, he developed and led a three-day intensive program on physician wellness for the American Academy of Hematology. For more than 45 years, yeah, all of you guys out there have been, I've been doing this three years, I'm a veteran. <laughs> more than 45 <laughs> years, he's been helping people find lasting change, contentment, and a more awakened life as they move past crippling emotions like anxiety, stress, depression, and burnout with his short-term, powerful, compassionate approaches. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming on and uh, having this fun little convo today. I really appreciate it. Kyle, you're honoring me by having uh, me here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to help so many people like you do constantly, but particularly, as we said before we started, during this very, very emotionally challenging time. We, can, we can't do enough to help people calm themselves and live peacefully during this otherwise very, very unbalanced time. Absolutely. And uh, I think there are, there are a lot of people right now, they'll see people like us uh, pushing and preaching positivity and they're like, you know, uh, not understanding how can we still be positive amidst the chaos? Does that mean that we aren't empaths? And I try to stress to them, that people like us were built and born for this. And part of that is the fact that we're incredibly empathetic. We care so much about people and humanity that we know that we, we have developed and spent our lifetimes developing the skill sets and, and whatnot to help people in this time. And for you, having, having done this on such a fascinating level for so long, uh, how does it feel to be, to be called in at this moment? Are you, are you feeling just like, wow, I'm ready or wow, I'm overwhelmed? No, I'm definitely ready. I'm, I'm, I'm always ready. I, I feel that if a day goes by where I haven't somehow connected with people, I mean, heart, when one heart touches another heart, that's the only time you really have communication. And I feel like whether it's through a mechanism, like truly, I mean, it being honored by having, by you asking me to participate in this way, or the, I'm writing a, at least one column a day. Uh, putting it out there nationally, uh, or, or phone calls literally all around the country. Um, if I feel it, if a day goes by, we're, that's just standard operating procedure for folks like us. We, that's what we love to do. It's our mission. It's our purpose. It's what we wake up in the morning being grateful for. Yes. Uh, I have a practice. It's really very simple. It's almost simplistic. I go to bed at night and I think to myself, what went right today? What went, went well? What went good today? Usually a couple things that I think about. It flashes by. I think about them and go off to sleep. Um, and then when I wake up, the first thing I think about is that I'm grateful that I woke up. Thank you for giving my life back, so to speak. But then I think about what might go well today. What could, not what will. I don't, I'm not a prophet, you know, I have a crystal ball in my office, but it doesn't really work. Um, <laughs> but what might go well? And I think about some things that could happen. And this morning I woke up and thought, well, one of the things that can go well is that this, this opportunity with you is going to just go really well. We're going to reach some people. So yeah, that's how I think about, about what I do. And I'm sure you do this very similar kinds of thinking. 
Absolutely. I feel like every time you and I find ways to connect through different social media mechanisms uh, or if we're out and about, it's, it's an immediate uh, taking to the, you know, if you can't change your circumstances, change your perspective. <laughs> and I thought one of the, one of the really interesting uh, pieces that you, that you mentioned there is just the gratitude practice. And I feel like for most people, gratitude is so simplistic at its basic nature that they start saying, well, how can gratitude be effective? I, I know that, but it doesn't mean that they do that. Um, what would you say to somebody who doesn't really practice gratitude and doesn't understand the mechanisms, you know, as a, as a uh, person who's an expert related to psychology, I would love to hear your, your take on gratitude. A couple of things. First of all, I want to tell you a story about a young child uh, that I used to take care of who had autism. I'll come back to that one. R remind me about yeah. that. Yes. But I want to tell you that I think that when people look at us and they say, oh, there he is in a bubble with a positive thinking. Oh, everything is great. Right, Michael? Uh, or, oh, he's always thankful for something. Yeah, it doesn't work, Michael. What they mean erroneously is they think by staying positive and by being grateful that somehow your external world is going to change. No, it's not the point. It's the internal world that we're trying to elevate. My little, my little autistic uh, client that I had many, many years yes. ago, I told his parents I would uh, start taking care of him. This is when I was still practicing psychology and we were treating patients. Um, I said, I'll take him on, but you have to make a promise. We're never going to use the word autistic. But he ha I know what he has, but the school, I know what the school says, but you want me to take care of him? We're never going to use the term. Well, one day um, into the work that we were doing, he came in and he uh, said to me, I think I'm having an autistic anger attack. And I said, and the mother was in the, in the room. I looked at her, I said, I'm sorry, what word did you use? And she said, I promise you, I didn't say that word. I didn't use that word. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, maybe you were just angry. It had nothing to do with having autism. And he said, oh, you mean like I could just be happy that I have autism and that even though I have it, I can be angry and it doesn't mean anything other than I'm just angry? I said, exactly. Wow, what changed? Just the way he thought. Just the way he thought. That was it. I asked him, what are you grateful for? And one day, and he said, nothing. So what went right today? Nothing. Well, when you walked up the stairs to my office, did the stairs crash down? No. When you came home from school, did your mom have something to eat for you? Well, yeah, she's supposed to. Can you appreciate how life changed when he saw that he could be grateful for those mundane things. You and I take nothing for granted. Nothing. I come to a stop sign. I, I oh, I'm just, people think I'm crazy, and I maybe I go, oh, thanks. What are you thanking this stop sign for? For stopping me so I don't get smashed. <laughs> so the littlest thing you get a flat tire say thank you for giving me this flat tire because if i didn't get the flat tire maybe three blocks from now something bad would have happened so i look for opportunities all around the first article i wrote uh, i mean three a couple of weeks ago about covid19 was what a wonderful time of opportunity and people wrote and go oh there he goes again he's crazy with that have opportunity stuff if you want to get rid of your fear to grow mentally fit, start by recognizing we're not changing the external. We want to change the internal. What's between our ears and behind our eyes, our thoughts. That is so powerful and so it, it's, it's, it's just like any other muscle. You need to work it every day to get the fortitude. You can't be like, all right, all of a sudden I'm going to go from being a pessimistic or sorry, like they like to say a realist and <laughs> realism doesn't exist. Realism is perception based upon your own life experiences and how you interpret them. Right. So that yeah. there's no such thing as a realist. It doesn't actually exist in nature. 
So to me, uh, I, I get such a, a kick out of, out of when people think like, okay, I can be positive all the time. And the answer is I practice positivity in every circumstance that I can. And there are moments in my humanity where that will, where, where anger will slip in or anything else will slip in. It's not to be like a robot, but it's to address it, get awareness as fast as possible and return back to harmony. And in, in your day-to-day, uh, day-to-day practice, you've got 18 grandkids, right? 18? No, I have eight. No, no, no what I'm oh. talking about, I have, I have it. My, our, old, yeah. <laughs> our oldest grandson is 18. Oh, your oldest grandson is 18. We have six grandchildren. Yeah. Okay, so you have six grandchildren and how many you kids? You scared me there, Kyle. Yeah. 18 grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. So six grandkids and how many kids? Two sons. So you have two sons, six grandkids. You have to manage your stuff, their stuff, your job. You're, you're, not, you're not coming out of this as a, as a, as a 20-year-old. So oh, that was that was over fifty years ago. <laughs> exactly. So, so what what you've shown though is that mental resiliency is one of the most important things to focus on. If not as much, if not ten x, you know the physical muscles which can go change, modify at any time, but that they're all interconnected. Uh, where where did you like you, you're you're we met in the gym? That, that's the irony of this whole thing. Fifteen years ago. Where did you get into the fitness space and the fitness side, you know, with ACE, for example, uh, related to uh, the power of fitness in the mind? Right. Great question. Um, many years ago, I was reading an article. We were back east visiting uh, our grandkids. And I was laying on the floor playing with my granddaughter, who was, I don't know, three, three years old at the time, whatever. And um, I was reading an article in the New York Times with her. There's only three, and I'm reading this article about how the, this group called the American Council on Exercise was going to eradicate obesity by 2020 or 2030. I don't remember what it was anymore. And I started laughing, and she said, Papa, why are you laughing? And I told her, and I tried to explain it to her in three-year-old language. And uh, uh, my father had obesity. He died of it when he was 55 years old. Uh, the day that I opened my private practice office for uh, working for the San Diego Police Department, I wrote my thesis on the psychological aspects of obesity. Um, and uh, in any case, um, I called the American Council on Exercise. I said, hey, I read that you're going to eradicate obesity uh, by focusing on diet and exercise. And you guys have built a tripod with only two legs. What do you mean? Well, you left off the third, and I believe the most important leg, and that's thinking. It got quiet. They said, well, we'd like to talk with you. Where are you located? And I said, oh, I'm in New York. And the woman, I don't want to mention her name, said, oh, that's, that's, a, that's too bad because our headquarters are in San Diego, California. And I said, well, this is a meant to be because I live in San Diego, California, and I'll be home in two weeks. And uh, (laughs) two and a half half weeks later, we had a meeting. And three weeks after that, I became the first uh, senior consultant for behavior sciences for the American Council on Exercise. And I got steeped in fitness. Always was, but that really brought me steeped into it. My wife became a fitness trainer when she was, uh, I guess, 60 years old. Um, and it's, it's part of our daily life. Uh, and so that's how we, you and I connected at the yeah. gym. Yeah. Uh, um, unbelievable. And, and I think right now that's one piece that's, that's a pretty exciting piece that's happening right now is I think a lot of people are saying, well, I'm working out, I'm following my nutrition plan, but I'm in total utter chaos. Maybe I need to realize that the rest of me needs to get into alignment. So if somebody's in the midst of, let's just say, uh, an emotional breakdown of sorts right now, or they're emotionally a mess and they're watching it seep in and integrate into uh, how they eat or how they train, or, or even if they're eating and training right, but just their bottom line happiness isn't there, what would you call 
probably like the first best step somebody could take if they wanted to take action now on a behavior change related to their psych? Well, there's so many places to enter that. It really depends on the person. And obviously I would want to partner with that person to help understand what they believe are the limiting thoughts that he or she is having. Right. Um, what thoughts do you believe are in your way? Is it perfectionism? Is it guilt? Is it self-blame? Is it the belief I can't do it? Is it the belief um, I have fear? There's a whole host. Um, what we're looking for ultimately is to help people disturb themselves less emotionally. Uh, inevitably, it comes down to something that I write about and talk about a lot, uh, but it's not the same for everyone. Uh, in general terms, I call it DALPO, D-A-L-P-O, not the dog food, Alp mm -hmm. DALPO. The first is someone might be thinking a demand. This, I, this should be easy. I should be able to do it. I shouldn't have this feeling of hesitation. I should look like that person. Uh, I should have the motivation he has. All these shoulds. And um, the, my, my old teacher and mentor, Albert Ellis, used to say in his Bronx, New York way, shouldhood leads to shithood. <laughs> 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 so we help people get, get in touch with the fact that that's probably what they're doing, shoulding on themselves. The next yep. is, this is horrible. Uh, I couldn't lift 50 pounds. This is terrible. I can't. It's, it's catastrophic. I missed a workout. How, how awful am I? So we look for awfulizing, number two. Three, we look for low frustration tolerance. I can't stand this. I can't stand the pressure I feel. I can't stand the, the you know, what happened, how I feel if I miss a, an opportunity to go work out. Or I can't stand that I have to work out. We reduce the uh, frustration tolerance by elevating it to, you know, it's not horrible. It's just unfortunate that I missed the workout or I can't lift 50 pounds, but I can lift 20. It's good to start somewhere. We get rid of the P, the personalizing, the, the, the labeling. I'm a, I'm a loser. I'm a weakling. I'm too fat. And we look at the, which is a dirty word, fat. And then we also get rid of the O, the overgeneralizing, meaning I'll never get in shape. I'll never get muscle. I'll never lose weight. I'm always going to look like this. So between getting rid of people's demands, their awfulizing or catastrophizing thinking, their low frustration tolerance and replacing it with high frustration tolerance, getting rid of negative self-labels and getting rid of this overgeneralizing, this predicting of always or never, people learn to become aligned. One quick little technique that I use, that I teach trainers, before you, you have a session, this will take no more than a few minutes, have people visualize success or have them take one of their hands, left or right, left, put it on their stomach, have them breathe in to the count of four, hold it and exhale to more than the count of four. Ideally double, but it doesn't matter. Into the count of four, out to the count of six or seven. What that does is begin to focus and align mind and body. A little bit of mindfulness, awareness of present breathing helps people slow down so that they can catch those erroneous, irrational thoughts that I just went through. Hope I, I that wasn't that. too much. Hope that wasn't too much. <laughs> that to me was absolutely, it's just gold because I stress with people, pe people get upset typically that I don't have a scale when I had my physical location, they'd come in, they'd be like, let's weigh ourselves. I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't have a scale. They're like, what? I'm like, like you've done this. I'm like, oh, why? I'm like, are you a suitcase? Am I going to get a baggage fee if I bring you with me? <laughs> Unless you're competing in something, I can't tell you why we have to know that number, let alone base all of our self-esteem on it. Right. So, the scale only weighs 
your pounds. It doesn't yes. weigh your self worth. No. Oh, I love that. I've never heard that before. That's beautiful. It doesn't. It, it only weighs. How, it tells you how much you weigh, not how much you're worth. One of the most important things that we that I work on with clients, regardless of whatever it is that they're working on, is this notion of unconditional self acceptance. See, self esteem or self worth is like psychological cancer. In psychology, I believe self esteem is cancer, mm. and we want to we want to we want to get rid of that. So let's focus not on conditional self esteem. If I can just lose two pounds this week, that's what it says you're supposed to do. So that's what I got to do. Otherwise, I'm a loser. No, even though I have not lost two pounds this week. I still accept myself. I don't like it. I wish I did, but I'm not going to rate myself based on some action. I rate my actions. I always leave myself alone. Yes, yes. The self abuse. So there, there's there's two parts that are that are monumental based off of what you said. One is the unconditional part of of self acceptance, and and if you're not afraid of the L word, self-love. <laughs> that right. to me is, is a paramount piece of it. And the second part is understanding the importance of self, uh, of, uh, of forecasting failure before you even begin, right? Not setting up, I am going to win. I can handle this. I can do all of this if only I was you. But because I'm me, I never lose weight. I'm never going to do this. My body will never change. It's like you're setting yourself up for failure. And, you know, it's uh, whatever you think is going to be the end outcome. What would you say would be the first step uh, in the visualization process? Like, how, how would you walk somebody through a visualization process of success uh, when you're typically working with them? Well, um, I try to focus on the process more than the outcome. Uh, that's, that's number one. So uh, we, we may talk about the steps you will take um, to get where you hope to go, not demand to go, not uh, set as the goal. If I, we, I get rid of if then thinking, we want to eliminate that too. Mm -hmm. If I succeed, then I'm okay. If I win, then I love myself. We want this unconditional self-love. When I was a little boy, seven or eight years old, uh, I was at my father and grandfather's shoe store. Uh, they were in the shoe business. They had shoe stores. And we're in one yeah. of the stores. My grandfather took me outside. He said, hey, look down the street at Mr. Davidson. What do you see? He owned the shoe store. We were Mantell shoes. He was Davidson shoes. Ah. We, were, we, were, we were on one end of the block. He was on the other. I looked down. I said, I see Mr. Davidson outside. What's he doing, Michael? He's staring at us. And what do you see coming out of his store? Nothing. And what do you see coming out of our store? Well, I don't know, a lot of people carrying bags. What does that teach you? Not to stare at someone else's store? And then he explained. Uh, <laughs> nice. Run your own business. Yes. Run your own race. Lift your own weights run your own, do your own walk. Don't compare and despair. See, he was sitting outside, standing outside of his store comparing. Well, why are they buying up there? Why aren't they buying from it? You know what? Take care of your store. Take, there's a great picture of uh, Michael Phelps in, in the, in the uh, swimming, in, in the, in the uh, Olympics. And he's just about to touch the end for the gold medal. And the guy in the lane next to him is swimming, but he's staring at Michael Phelps. Uh, There's no way he could win. No. He was staring at Michael Phelps. How do I compare I to Michael? People, not how is my race? Right. So I help people visualize that. Uh, what are you going to be looking at? What are you going to be watching? Uh, what are you going to be telling yourself that will be in your way? Look, a, a, a 25 pound barbell doesn't scare anybody. One of the things that I try and teach people is every emotion you have, every comes from inside of your own thinking, from your own thoughts. 
a barbell. Oh my God, that scares me. It's a barbell. <laughs> How can that scare you? Well, what if I drop it? That's what you were saying earlier. And mm -hmm. if then, if I drop it, I'll hurt myself. Well, what else could you be thinking? That I won't drop it? Yeah, what about thinking that? If I take people through a lot of these, there's no one thing that I use. It's a, it really depends on the individual. Again, coming back to what they are telling themselves that's in their way. The right tool for the right person at the right time. That's, uh, that's a master. That's the difference between uh, just learning one tool and then making it, uh, making it a religion. Uh, I, I see on the, on the little bit darker side is I see somebody read one book on psychology or one book on mindset, and now they are instantly grabbing the microphone of social media as an expert. <laughs> so if, 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 if we wanted to, instead of uh, criticize, but we wanted to guide them down a path and they want to, their intentions are good and they want to help and inspire and motivate, what would you recommend would be a good starting point for someone who's looking to get involved with ways to address, let, let's say it's a trainer, for example, and they're looking for ways to address the psychological component? Well, um, this is a, a, a touchy subject. Right. Because today, many trainers, and, and I think uh, we need to, I, I think we need to get rid of the word trainer. Right. There I said it. Okay. I do too. Training is, is for other species. Yes. Life. Yes. Agreed. Somebody calls me a personal we, trainer. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not training horses. So stop. Exactly. Thank you very much. I hate it. I Thank hate you. that word. I hate that title. So we're officially changing it, ladies and gentlemen. You this call right here, it's gone. We may call it an exercise instructor, a fitness coach. Um, back, at the, back at ACE many, many years ago, um, I said, you know, why are we calling it? Uh, I, gave, I gave the, uh, what did they call it? The keynote address for when they had their annual conference. Mm -hmm. And I called it Pathway to the Future, train, uh, excuse me, coaching, not training. Um, and still we call them fitness trainers. But if I was looking for one idea to give across to someone who's interested in becoming a fitness uh, physiology exercise expert, it would be go beyond certification. Yes, you can read the manual. Yes, you can take the test. Yes, you can press the button on the computer, close your eyes. I passed, I'm a professional. This isn't going to make me popular, but you're not. You're just starting. Yep. Go get an associate's degree. Go get a bachelor's degree. Go for additional training. Um, there are even the certifications. Some of the certifications are much higher ranked than others today. So go beyond the certification. Take as many extra continuing education credits as you can. And by all means, if your cert has never tested you with hands-on experience, and the first time you actually train a client, that's the first time you've ever touched another human being in training or instruction, you're missing something. Yes. So get, it, get an internship. Work under an expert like Kyle. Work under someone and have them supervise your work. Physicians psychologists, veterinary, veterinary technicians, dental technicians have hands-on supervision. Why shouldn't exercise instructors or trainers? I believe they, that, that, that it's required. Fully agree. Then, then spend every day devoted to learning something new, not in social media, not by some celebrity trainer who taught uh, Gwyneth Paltrow how to do whatever she does, but the real deeper stuff, go look at the uh, more, the higher level folks who are talking about this at a higher level, because it isn't, you know, what I read in men's health magazine that I transfer over to, uh, to uh, training. Um, let's go beyond that and elevate all of this profession as it is. All right. Well, we just switched us into gallery view. So now we're both, we get to be side by side on the rest of this recording. So, uh, so, uh, 
kind of bringing us back into the most uh, the most quintessential step, which is getting out of that current fear state and into a place of power and empowerment right now. So I feel like what's a big part of what's happening that really, I, I really feel nature has such a great sense of humor. And, and one, of the, one of the funny things that's happening is so many people have been preached to for so long on the idea of get outside and play. Stop looking at your devices. Get off of all the internet and the video games and go connect with people. And I feel like there's a reverse psychology that is going on right now that is finally saying, fine, go do only that. And everyone's going, ah, and now they need to, you know, face their demons of sorts. What would you say to somebody right now if they're, if they're in this, in this shift and, and they're now realizing that, wow, maybe social connection is important. Where would you recommend somebody go about utilizing and understanding and practicing uh, social connection and the needs for, for social connection right now? Well, as soon as a coronavirus uh, hit and uh, the media jumped on this term social distancing, uh, you may have seen on my Facebook uh, uh, where I happen to be a little bit active. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I, I instantly said, uh, stop, time out, not social distancing, physical distancing. Yes. Let's replace the social distancing nonsense with reality, stay home, stay healthy, stay safe, but stay socially connected. And um, I, I believe that you're right. See, you see the, the interesting opportunity that COVID-19 brings to us. This is a chance for us to reevaluate. This is a chance for us to rethink the way we thought about physical activity, movement, social connection. Uh, when my wife and I go for a walk now and we see people in the neighborhood and we're walking around outside, we cross the street, we say hi to people. Uh, these are people who may have passed us in the car and never waved. Suddenly there's an opportunity for a little bit of connection. We have dinner uh, with our kids and grandkids and they're on the other side of the country. Uh, we have um, a Friday night meal with some friends, uh, you know, who ordinarily we'd be together with but we're doing it on Zoom conference now. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that holidays, uh, Passover and Easter are coming up, and it's going to be a challenge. We, I believe, I, I wrote a column recently called, in order to be emotionally stable or fit, we need to get all effed up. <laughs> hey, what did you say? Yeah, F. F, F, stop. We need friends, we need fun, and we need focus. So what I try to help people understand is, just as you did like naturally, you connected. Hey, Mother Nature is playing a trick on us, but what a great trick. Here's an opportunity. I can be with my friends, I can still be with them, albeit not physically for, for good healthy sense reasons. We can create some fun. Let's go to the Guggenheim Museum this afternoon. Well, how are we gonna do that? Watch, boop, 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 boop. And there's the Guggenheim right on our computer. And we're going through the museum together. Let's go on a safari. Uh, oh yeah, we're going on a safari now. So uh, I think that we can be, we can spend more time being focused with gratitude and mindfulness now. This is giving us a chance to do that. Uh, and I think that, look, I'm very big on faith. It's not necessarily the most popular thing to talk about, but hey, my age, I don't care anymore. Me neither. Uh, I think faith means, for me, means feelings anchored in trust and hope. F-A-I-T-H. Nothing beats fear more than getting rid of the words going to, because that's the, that's the, that's the, anchor of all anxiety, predicting, going to, hey, no, you know, I have feelings anchored in trust and hope. I hope it doesn't happen. But if it does, A, maybe there's an interesting reason. What can I learn? How can I grow through this, not just go through this? 
and maybe it won't happen. What am I scaring myself for? I'm taking away time now. Um, another long answer, and I apologize for that, uh, Kyle. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's no long answers. There's only good answers. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there's another reframe for you. <laughs> Love it. I, I really, I really believe right now that uh, that the the faith piece is a very interesting test, and I don't think that most people um, are looking at faith the right way. I think so many of them are looking at it through the eyes of my religion is right. Your religion is wrong. This is all Armageddon happening. And, and then something great is going to happen when we go through this torture. And I personally have a, have a faith that hell is a place in your mind that you can put yourself any moment you want <laughs> or choose to escape any moment you want, unless God forbid you have some serious psychological disorder and, and, and that's, that's not the status quo. So that's not the normal. So I think a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today is really um, applied faith in many cases, not just a, a, oh, I'm looking on, you know, I need to endure right now and be miserable so that something will be good once I'm dead. But like, I have faith that we are a resilient species, that regardless of what's happening, we can see a seed of opportunity and come together as a community. And that at, at this moment right now, I also have faith, but regardless of whatever your faith is, uh, religiously, spiritually, energetically, that, that faith right now is there's also a strong need for the faith in humanity. And for, for a lot of people, who feel like they've lost their faith in humanity. Is there, is there something that you've seen based on your background and all these incredible years of dealing with the human mind um, that, that maybe can give people a little bit of hope related, related to faith? Well, the power of our own mind. Um, I sometimes will ask people to do this little experiment. I want you to imagine making yourself feel really glum, really down in the dumps. What would you think of? Well, I think of the time that, you know, my parent died or uh, the time that uh, we got divorced or, well, um, that terrible car accident and two people were killed. And when you I would think about it a little bit, oh, boy, well, thinking about it, it makes me feel so bad. Exactly. Now let's think about a happy time in your life. Oh, oh, like when I was like seven years old, I got this great gift. And oh, yeah, that, think about that. See that you turn it on and you turn it off. You can make yourself feel good or make yourself feel bad. You have that power. I believe that just like physical strength is based on agility and balance and coordination and endurance and strength, those same terms apply to emotional fitness. And resilience is about emotional balance, I should say, is about being mentally agile. How can I pivot in this situation? How else can I think about it? How can I stay balanced? How can I make sure that I'm not going off in, in what I call unhealthy negative, negative emotions and stay in the healthy negative emotion range? Concern, healthy negative emotion. Anxiety, unhealthy. Um, uh, worry, healthy negative emotion, fear, unhealthy. So how can I stay B balanced, C coordinated? How do I get my mind coordinated in a way that I can bring to bear to solve this problem? Well, if I'm not pivot, pivoting, agile, balanced, if I don't have the psychological strength, I convince myself I don't, I can't co bring coordination to solve this problem. Where physical fitness, we know what that means. Emo being emotionally fit, F-I-T, I believe stands for being fundamentally independent thinking. Yes. I'm disconnected from any external circumstance through a very simple word, regardless. So I help clients, whether it's business clients or tr fitness trainers or 
gym owners or, or you know, j everyday Jane and Joe, Joe and James, whatever you call it, um, use the word regardless. So right now, uh, we're not working. I can't pay the rent. I, I can't even go out and buy food. I'm afraid I'm going to get the coronavirus. Regardless, I'll be okay. Fundamental, fundamentally independent thinking understands that, that the coronavirus can infect me and make me ill, but it doesn't determine my emotion. It doesn't make right. me feel happy, sad, angry, scared, or whatever it might be. It only makes me sick. It doesn't make me fearful. That I do to myself. Wow. Beautifully, beautifully stated. It gives all the power back to you and your choices. Simple as that and as expansive as that. So awesome. Thank you for taking the time today. This was a ton of fun and hopefully helpful tool for any of our friends, uh, anyone within the Fit365 community, anyone who is really just looking for some peace of mind right now and an opportunity to not just see the bright side in this, but experience uh, the harmony they deserve. So thank you. And, and if Michael, somebody wants to get in touch with you or follow you on social, what's the best way? Follow me on Facebook. Uh, my name, Michael Mantel. Follow me on Facebook. It's simple. You'll get my daily five every day. I haven't missed a day in, I think, five years. Wow. Um, I put up uh, things all during the day that are inspirational, motivational, uh, positive, and, and uh, anchored in uh, easy how to apply. Sometimes they're funny memes, uh, but uh, get, get in touch with me that way. I, I, I don't drive people to my website. I have one, drmichaelmantel.com. I drive people to me. Yes. If you want to be in touch with me, be in touch. Dr. Mantell, D-R-M-A-N-T-E-L-L, -L, at me.com. Write to me. I promise you, in an, in an astonishingly short, quick turnaround time, I will have a response back to you. D-R-M-A-N-T-E-L-L, -L, at me.com, or follow on Facebook. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, and and you'll you'll see me there too because uh, we we have great uh, lifting each other up back and forth on Facebook and love it. It's been a great way to keep in touch with you all these years. So, yeah, thank you. you. Uh, totally appreciate taking the time today. Thank you very much for the honor of being on with you, Kyle. I wish you uh, and your family health and uh, peace and calm during this difficult time. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon.